Um, well, my name is Michael Green. As you can see, I've been around for a long time. And um, the joy of it is nearly all of my life I've been involved with student work and still am. And so it's nice to be invited here today to uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, perhaps the biggest way I've seen some change is the numbers. I mean, we're well aware these days of what a secularised world we're living in. And uh, we often don't realise that the Christian church has never grown as fast as it has in um, our generation. This morning I had an email from Lindsay Brown, who uh, used to be the director of the IFES and now doing a great work in Europe. Lindsay's just come back from Spain to he been speaking in Valencia to uh, um, 500 uh, students, uh, GBU, and this is their 50th anniversary. Well now, a few years ago, there was nothing like that in Spain. And this is happening in a number of countries. In others, they're still struggling. But um, I, I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is growth. I think another thing I've noticed is um, better preparation and better follow-up. Now that's certainly not universal. Some is absolutely dismal. But uh, there are places where the preparation is careful and that the different Christian groups really work together instead of polarizing. It's one of the tragedies, I think, of um, Christianity when it's a minority movement, is that they all split up into little, little groups uh, and all say, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos and that sort of thing. Um, but when you get unity uh, in the gospel, um, and you've seen much more of that now than you did, uh, no longer the same um, you know, this is the Rabbi Zacharias outfit and this is the IFES one and so on. There's much more um, community in the gospel and that's very healthy. Um, another thing that wasn't there many years ago is these uh, language camps in the summer uh, <clears throat> and they're valuable because you've got a cross-pollination of different cultures. Um, uh, another thing you see in, in some countries, and particularly in Poland, magnificent uh, use of drama and, um, uh, and, and mime. And, you know, in the old days it would have been street proclamation. Uh, I believe in proclamation, but I believe in using the creative arts as well. And so the power of music and drama and dance and so on um, we're beginning to see more of that in Europe as we are in England. So yes, there's advance, but of course the gospel is the same, but the wrappings need to be different according to the culture. The thing that strikes me as an Englishman going to the continent is that you've got these two enormous old oak trees um, of Christianity, Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And both of them have had their, their good things that they've done, but both of them have lost the modern generation. And so you've got students who um, have had, they've either been burnt off by the church or they've never had anything to do with it. And that affects the spiritual climate. And then you also think that most of these countries have come out of um, a communist situation. And in the post-communist situation, there's a lot of communist ideology and um, uh, burnt-in atheism. But there's also um, a lot of consumerism and materialism. And we're getting out of this straitjacket and now we're free. And so it becomes very hedonistic and very self-serving. And all of those things make the... Um, the atmosphere forbidding. Add to that the fact that any evangelical work in almost anywhere in Europe is regarded as a sect and it's not much fun belonging to a sect and so the customers tend to keep their heads down and there isn't the confident boldness uh, that I would like to see. Sometimes there is but on the whole there isn't and that affects the spiritual climate and people don't expect God to do great things. They don't expect conversions. 
when you have meetings. I, I always do. And um, I ask them before I do a meeting, I say, how many people believe that God is going to bring somebody to himself here? And either nobody or perhaps one hand will come up. And I said, well, I know he will, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And it does change lives. And of course, they're all covered with confusion when they see 10 people coming to Christ. It happens all the time. I love it. Um, if you could go back and do it all again, what would you do differently? I'd learn some more languages. <laughs> because people deserve to hear the gospel in the language in which they were born. And it is amazing, time and again, I have seen people coming to Christ. When I've been standing here, my translator has been standing there, and you see people in tears coming to Christ. Uh, yet it's through translation. Well, that's amazing. But we really shouldn't put them to that. And so, um, if I had my time again, I would try to be um, a better linguist. There are other things as well. Um, the whole area of uh, apologetics, I don't think I paid enough attention to that when I was young. I now realise that apologetics never saved anybody, but it is a very valuable tool for moving the rubbish out of the road that leads to Christ. It needs to be the handmaid of evangelism, not to be um, some uh, metaphysical discussions that never bring anybody uh, to conclusion. There is a protectionism over Christian organisations, especially when they're uh, part of a, a minority culture in a country. Uh, and that protectionism is very alien to the gospel. Uh, the Lord loves to bless when people sink their uh, private uh, banners and um, pull together for the good news. So I think that that is um, a, a very, that unity is, is, is a very, very important thing. Uh, I've seen a number of, of individuals um, gone from one country like Italy to go and work um, in um, a quite different country like Finland. And um, that cross-cultural Christianity is so good because it is saying, hey, look, this gospel doesn't belong to a country or to a denomination. It belongs to the world. And uh, we're all part of it together. These are very difficult days. And um, there is no doubt that the Christian gospel is facing challenges that it's never faced before on things like transgenderism and a whole host of, of sexual um, uh, things which were almost unknown in days gone by, but are now major. Now, that's the sort of challenge which um, no previous generation has had to face. And um, today's uh, Christian young men and women have got to get so rooted in the gospel that they are able to handle challenges of this sort. Obviously, the, um, the, the same old problems will come, uh, as well as new ones like this. Does God exist? Can you be sure about it? What about all the other faiths? How could a good God allow suffering? These old hoary chestnuts keep coming back and they need fresh, new, contextualised answers. And that challenge will continue <coughs> for the next generation of students. But I think that um, I can't sit here and predict what challenges will face students. Uh, what I think I can do is say, um, you're going to, if you want to face the future, you've got to have one foot in the scriptures and one foot in the culture. When you look back on recent years, you see uh, liberal Christianity has been great on the culture, but has lost contact with the apostolic gospel. The conservatives have been passionate about the gospel, but they have often not understood the culture and have not therefore been a bridge over the troubled waters from the culture to Christ.
So I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and I think it's a big challenge because I've noticed that many students, they don't have a devotional time of reading the Bible and praying um, as they used to. And so they're not rooted and grounded in the scriptures. And so when they come upon these really hot issues that um, have never been faced before, such as the sexual ones, um, then they, they really just have to give an opinion instead of coming out of a rooted biblical worldview. So perhaps that's the, biblic the, the biggest challenge for the future. Obviously the digital world is going to develop in a way that uh, I've, I've got no idea, but it's, the pace is so enormous that uh, that's obviously, they've got to keep up with that. But quite certainly there's got to have one foot in the culture and one in the scriptures. And it's very easy to fail on one or other, or indeed both of those. And great is the crash when that happens. I want the inner reality of students joining with other committed Christian students in the work of the Gospel in the University. Because these students need to be with other students who are keen Christians from a different denomination, from a different nation, from a different culture. They need to be God's counterculture in the university, not in some salt cellar belonging to some church. So um, while I always, and I've just been doing this with two grandchildren, um, work hard to get them into a live church, I work very hard to get them uh, into the Christian Union and uh, they can then <coughs> learn from the passion of their mates, get involved, and the different talents of um, an active Christian student body is dynamic. Um, but it's so bad if they don't join a body like the IFES. It really is. And I've seen it in country after country, I don't know that I ought to embarrass anybody by mentioning the countries, but I have seen, you know, you go to do a mission in a place and you find the seven different tiddly-winky groups um, of Christians um, instead of one coherent whole, and that is disastrous. So I would very strongly urge people um, to join uh, a Bible-based organisation that is passionately evangelistic in outreach and coherent in fellowship um, and of the classic example is the IFES worldwide. At the end of my life I look ahead to the next 10 years and um, what do I think is the most important thing for student work um, worldwide? It's very simple. You've got to have one foot in the culture You've got to have one foot in the gospel and you've got to have a heart blazing with passion to pass on this gospel that has made new people of you. Unless there is a new life and a new lifestyle in us, nobody's going to listen to us. But if there is, and if we're determined to reach them, nothing will be able to stand against us. Did not Jesus promise that the gates of Hades would not be able to stand against the proclamation by his kingdom. And he's never been proved wrong yet.